Welcome everyone to the Gold Silver Bitcoin Show. We are honored today to be sitting down with Graham Moore, the author of B is for Bitcoin. He's also worked in the space for many years now. Thank you for joining us, Graham. Thanks for having me, Justin. How is it in New York currently as far as the Bitcoin and crypto scene goes? Are there meetups? Is there a lot of activity going on or has that all been sort of uh, put on hold for now? No, it's, uh, it's picking back up a lot. And so I actually moved to New York officially uh, almost, I, I think it was about one year ago today. I can't remember if it was uh, the beginning of August or the end of August, but, uh, but last year I moved here officially full time. Uh, and yeah, there wasn't, there wasn't much going on last year in New York. I was pretty, pretty much a ghost town uh, for the most part, but no, things are definitely picking back up. So last week I went to a party with uh, Lolly. Are you familiar with Lolly? And so, yeah, for anybody listening who doesn't know Lolly, the way I describe Lolly is it's a, uh, it's like the Honey uh, browser extension where if you, when you go to a checkout, Honey gives you a coupon code that you might not have found online. By contrast, Lolly, it's a browser extension you install it into your web browser. And then when you go to some websites, Lolly will say, hey, we'll give you 1% Bitcoin back if you buy this t-shirt or whatever it is. And so a really easy way for people to, to stack sats and make some Bitcoin without having to really open an account on an exchange, understand what Bitcoin is, understand why Bitcoin is important, just go buy all of the regular stuff that you need to buy and you're going to get some free Bitcoin for doing so. Lolly got my wife into Bitcoin. <laughs> I don't think right. I tried too hard over the world or over the right. years to kind of get her into uh, Bitcoin. But once I showed her Lolly, it was pretty much a sealed deal. Yeah. And then, uh, so New York from Canada. Growing up, Graham, we were always told that Canada was this land of like uh, lollipops and <laughs> rainbows and unicorns probably. Although when I was growing up, I don't think unicorns held a the place in the kind of a collective consciousness as they do today. And would you agree with this sentiment? Did you run from Canada to get away from all the unicorns running around and the rainbows in the sky? It was, uh, it wasn't specifically that I came to New York, uh, for a girl, um, as I'm sure many people have done. Uh, so I started dating my girlfriend a few years ago. She's actually Canadian as well, but she's lived in New York for, for a number of years, uh, for school and then for fashion, uh, she works in the fashion industry. And so it, it was, it, it wasn't a huge deal going back and forth, Toronto to New York on flights. It's only about one hour, but just, it became time where we've been dating for enough time where I kind of said, okay. I'm, I'm done with, with traveling back and forth. Why don't I just move to New York? So I was able to get a work visa, uh, which was great. And so that, that was the move. Um, and in terms of the rainbows and, and unicorns uh, and everything being great in Canada, uh, that, that is not how I see it today. Um, and so my, my opinions on, on that have changed a lot, uh, especially with the last year where the Canadian government thinks it's their duty to protect everyone from everything that has ever existed. And uh, I do not share that sentiment. Um, and so uh, that's, that's one reason why I'm pretty happy to be in New York where it's a lot more liberal, not in the sense of the, uh, of the political liberal spectrum, but in the sense of people are sort of allowed to do what they want. And so New York was, was quite, draconian last year where if you were walking down the street and you didn't have a mask on people would yell and scream at you and say you were killing grandmas um but that that's since changed a lot and there's a lot more people outside that you're not seen as a terrible person if you decide to go for a run uh or if you decide to go to your friend's house whereas in canada that's still a little bit the case uh it, it's still you know if one person dies from from a certain illness we we need to prevent everyone from seeing everyone else and now it's not as bad as australia if people have seen on australia they brought in the military to prevent people from going outside uh, but it's uh it, it's much less fun being in canada today than it is being in the states for sure and of course i think when looking at the science regarding for instance face masks face masks in uh city settings there is very little literature saying either way if it's effective or ineffective at spreading, at the stopping the spread of disease. 
There is one study out of Denmark, which says that there is very much, there is such a small difference as to not really be quantifiable in terms of populations wearing masks, populations not wearing masks, and the rate of spread of disease. And last I checked, that was pretty much the only major study done on that topic. So if we're talking about the science, there is such a little amount of science that a lot of the protection going on by government of the citizens doesn't seem to be actually like scientifically justified in any real sense. Um, here we are. I'm, a, I'm actually uh, in Idaho now. I moved from California to mm -hmm. Idaho to get away from kind of, uh, well, I remember when I walked outside, I was living in downtown San Diego. And when I walked outside on March 15th and the parks were roped off with caution tape and I was only, and there were park rangers at the entrances of them. And I was only allowed on the sidewalk walk to walk alongside my neighbors in the name of preventing a disease. I knew that I was in trouble and that the people in San Diego might be in a little trouble. And so I came here to Idaho where I think they actually did a shutdown for two weeks to stop the spread. I think people generally speaking took that as a short vacation. And then after that two weeks, everything pretty much opened up. Everything's been open up since then. Um, the whole time I've been here since uh, October, November, it's been much more like 2019 than 2020 in, in every way, shape and form. So we hear things here about how it's going in New York or going in Los Angeles. And it still sounds quite draconian compared to kind of what we're experiencing here, I guess, in what might be considered a middle America. I'm also in this place that historically has been uh, over the last 15 years has been dubbed the American redoubt. And it's been highlighted on the map by, I guess, prepper types and survivalist types as a place to go to get away from cities and, and be somewhere with uh, resources and I think like-minded people. So that might play a role here, being in the American Redoubt. The radio here, Graham, it's very interesting. The talk radio here, it's all like um, very freedom oriented or uh, it's about aliens. So it's pretty cool. Um, how can you tell us a little bit more about like uh, what you're keeping an eye on in the Bitcoin world today? Yeah, I, I think it's adoption, adoption, adoption for me is what is important. Um, and so when I say adoption, it's it's not necessarily one thing in particular, it's just people becoming more comfortable that Bitcoin is here to stay and adopting it in their life or in their business in some in some meaningful form. So that, that can be on-chain metrics for how many wallets are holding Bitcoin uh, in a non-zero value or more than one Bitcoin or more than 10 Bitcoin. Uh, then that's also corporations feeling comfortable enough to add Bitcoin to their balance sheet. Uh, so we just saw the most recent and exciting example of that is Coinbase. Coinbase committed uh, to having Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies on their balance sheet as well. And I think they said something like 10% uh, of all their, uh, I can't remember if it's 10% of their profit or 10% of net fees or some, some, something like that. They're committed to just keeping uh, in crypto. So it's, they're not going to transfer that to dollars anymore. So, I mean, that's huge, right? And, and everyone was kind of waiting for that, for Coinbase to say, Hey, we aren't we aren't going to only hold dollars anymore, and so they finally did, and so I mean that that was amazing to see. The, the other part of adoption is in the financial space. So when is a Bitcoin ETF going to get approved? Obviously, and so Canada actually uh, is ahead of the U.S. on that. So I think Canada has maybe three Bitcoin ETFs um, at this point, and so that, that's pretty exciting in my opinion. So you know, I have my parents and some of my friends who are in Canada making sure in their uh, in their retirement funds that are tax protected, that they have some exposure to Bitcoin. I think the fees are only 1% or something a year. So, I mean, that's that's a pretty good option for people if they wanna buy Bitcoin and you know they don't wanna open an account on Coinbase and they don't wanna hold their own keys. It's obviously not very cypherpunk of them to do so and you know, not your keys, not your coins. But uh, for some people, that's what they need to take the first step. And I think we've seen that, that adoption is only growing because of these things where Bitcoin is becoming more comfortable. It's becoming something where you hear about it once, you dismiss it, you hear about it twice, you dismiss it, you hear about it three times, you might read an article and say, oh, maybe, I don't know. Then you see five of your friends say, oh yeah, I own a, I own Bitcoin through an ETF. And then you see 
10 of your friends say, oh yeah, I, I have a Bitcoin hardware wallet. I just bought it from this thing, ledger.com and you store these, these 24 words and, and I have it in a safety deposit box. And someone says, oh yeah, I have actually a multi-sig set up with Casa. And then you go, okay, wait. So 20 of my friends now have this thing. I, I, now it's become socially okay. And I know I will not be ostracized from the group and expelled uh, to a barren wasteland outside of any city if I now purchase this thing. And so I think that's where we are right now around the world, but, but especially in the Western world where they see, okay, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to be murdered uh, for potentially buying this thing. So why don't I get my toes wet? And why don't I see actually what this thing has to offer? And so that, that's what I'm keeping my eye on is just adoption. People no longer saying, oh, Graham's that weirdo. Um, <laughs> and so that, that's changed a lot in the last few years, which, which has been nice. Um, and, I, and I knew it would, um, but, but that, that's what I'm keeping my eyes on right now. I hope also it makes it okay to un actually understand basic economics. I think that'll be maybe one of the uh, big wins out of El Salvador. I don't think that Bitcoin's really going to be implemented in a significant manner in that country that helps a significant, the vast majority of that population for quite a while. I think it might mostly be a symbolic move. I think that the infrastructure in El Salvador, I've never been there. I have spent time in, in Latin America countries and I believe the, the infrastructure generally does move slow there. Um, I think though that there is an opportunity where people might be introduced to the ideas that inspired Bitcoin, which is sort of this ongoing Occupy Wall Street movement. You see Occupy Wall Street kind of uh, puttered out over the years, although it did, it was a social movement that actually made sense. Uh, it was targeting, I think, uh, a true commanding height of uh, kind of civilization, but it did peter out. And then Bitcoin, in my opinion, is sort of this ongoing Occupy Wall Street, but it is, I think, a far more uh, economic literate form of Occupy Wall Street than Occupy Wall Street was. That is precisely because the Austrian economics that seem to form the basis for Bitcoin makes more sense to me than, um, than Keynesianism or modern monetarism, which essentially says that debt isn't a bad thing. They might even say debt is a good thing. I'm sure the monetarists are the ones saying that uh, inflation is a good thing and that it will create jobs. Whereas uh, Austrian economists, for instance, I think as Hayek would write and which has actually been uh, quoted by Rand Paul, I think during recent coronavirus hearings that uh, it's far more effective when individuals in a society make decisions for themselves and steer their own fate rather than a few, I guess, bureaucrats make those decisions as we've seen uh, with uh, kind of in Western societies over the last uh, year plus. I'm hoping that Bitcoin in El Salvador could expose people to Austrian economics, to free market economics, which might go towards raising consciousness there in that country. And it's not just about becoming Bitcoiners or not becoming Bitcoiners. It's about the principles behind Bitcoin. And as Patrick Byrne postulates, Bitcoin is really kind of the result of 500 years of classic liberalism, of enlightenment philosophy. And I agree with that uh, take. And that's why I think that for some of, for these uh, Western democracies that are looking to remain sovereign right now, I think there are a lot of heads of states that are concerned about their so sovereignty. Bitcoin is aligned with those principles of sovereignty. And it's really an extension of uh let's just say some of the most recent enlightenment documents in our histories, which include the Bill of Rights, the US Constitution. I see Bitcoin in this lineage, and I hope that being introduced as a legal tender in Bitcoin could expand people's consciousness about enlightenment philosophy really generally. What do you think? Yeah, so so a few things to touch on there. Um, El Salvador, uh, I actually think it is a, a very, very big deal. Um, the reason being is, is we have the opportunity now in a lot of these countries that don't have great financial networks to actually just leapfrog the existing infrastructure. So we saw the same thing with cell phones being introduced into Africa. 
And so Africa, I think their landline penetration was, you know, it was very low. Um, very few people had landlines because it was so expensive and they just literally didn't have uh, the wires built everywhere. Um, so it was, it was very, very hard and it made no sense to have a phone because not everybody else had a phone. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then you drop a cell phone somewhere and anyone can use it anytime and you can buy uh, a crappy Android for 10 bucks or five bucks or, or whatever the case may be. And now everyone has cell phones in Africa. Not every single person, but the penetration is massive. And so then it makes sense to get a cell phone because everybody else has a cell phone. And the, one of the most interesting data points that, that got me really interested in Bitcoin early on was it, it was something like 50% of Kenyan GDP is conducted uh, with the, the use of cell phone minutes. And so M, M Pesa has massive penetration in Kenya. And so at that point, you see people trust cell phone minutes as money more than they do the government currency. And so that was so that was so interesting to me because I'd never heard of it before. And I'm going, oh my God, yeah. So I have all these uh, rich white people in, uh, in North America telling me Bitcoin can never be money because the government decides what money is um, without realizing that there's an example on earth today where 50% of a country's GDP is conducted uh, with cell phone minutes being used as money. And so when you hear that, you think, okay, no, we actually do have the ability for something really, really big to happen in El Salvador because, because what you said is, is infrastructure moves very slowly there. And that's correct, but digital infrastructure can move infinitely quickly. And so digital infrastructure can be installed in days, weeks. Um, physical infrastructure takes months or years to be installed. And so we have the same thing that we can do with cell phones that, that happen in Africa and, and also that happen in Latin America. We can do the same thing with Bitcoin, just kind of airdrop, uh, ready-made global uh, borderless infrastructure for capital markets and for, for money as well instantaneously um, and for essentially free, which is really, really cool. And so I, I don't know what's going to happen. I would still kind of call it an experiment. In El Salvador, you know, we have no idea what's going to happen, but I'm very, very optimistic on, on what it has the potential to do and what it has the potential to show others saying, hey, when you give your citizens uh, $5 of Bitcoin, $10 of Bitcoin, $100 of Bitcoin, and you give them access to interact with the people around them and also people in other countries, very importantly, other countries uh, for little to no fees, watch what happens to the prosperity of your nation. And so I think, I think we're seeing really, really cool things coming out of El Salvador with, the, with that leapfrogging uh, aspect. And uh, another thing to touch on, you mentioned, you know, individuals can make better decisions uh, than a few bureaucrats can somewhere else. I mean, that's, it's economics 101. So I, I took economics in university. You learn that pretty much in week one where the principal agent problem uh, is a massive thing. And so if, if anybody's listening and they don't know the principal agent problem, uh, if you are, uh, the, the principal, and so you're making decisions, um, and then there's an agent somewhere else that says, actually, I'm going to make decisions for you. Um, it generally doesn't work very well, and there's always some dead weight loss, um, if you want to use an economist term. But so I can make decisions very, very well for myself. I know exactly what I want. Maybe I'm stupid. Maybe I don't know all the information, and maybe someone else thinks they're smarter than me, but I'm always going to do what's in my best interest, and that is okay. And what happens when people start to get in, in, into problems is when they say, oh, but this other person knows more than you, so they should be able to make decisions on your behalf. And if we, can, if we could just centrally plan everything and make the optimal decision for every single person, things would go better. And that is true, right? Like if we could perfectly allocate all resources to everyone who needs them in the perfect mix, then yes, things would quote, maybe be better and we could experience, you know, better outcomes, but that will never work because individuals are best at making decisions for themselves. And maybe I don't make decisions that are optimally best for every single person in society, but I don't care. You know, I, I can't be, I can't be tasked with, with making that decision. And I don't want someone else to do that for me in thinking that they're doing the best thing for other people, because I always want to do what's best for myself. And I'm not going to hurt other people in doing that. Um, but I should be allowed to make my decisions because someone who's, who lives thousands of miles away, who has no idea who I am, who thinks that they know what's best for me, they do not know what's best for me. 
uh, it, it's it's the same same type of thing where uh, principal agent problem shows up in, in a ton of different scenarios. One can be where you hire a manager to go do something and your incentives aren't aligned. So I own a company and then I start paying a manager eighty thousand dollars a year to manage my business, but he has no equity in the business. He's only going to optimize decisions to make sure that he keeps getting rehired to make that eighty thousand dollars. He's not going to necessarily do what's best for the underlying equity of the business. Uh, you might hire a doctor, and the doctor is not aligned whatsoever with your health or well-being, and so you're outsourcing all of your health decisions to a doctor without understanding any of the implications yourself. That's another very huge problem. Where yes, maybe you do not have the correct medical expertise. But not every doctor knows everything about everything either. And so, so in that scenario, is the doctor, do they make more money if you are healthier? No. And so they are incentivized to just make sure that you keep showing up again and again. And so that's not to say doctors are evil and that they're going to hope that you're sick, but the principal agent problem is a, is a real thing. And it shows itself every single place in the world where the person making the decisions does not suffer the outcomes. And, and people need to get a better handle on what happens when you allow others to make decisions for you and you do not make decisions that are in the best interest for yourself. Rant, rant over, I guess. People equate this rugged individualism with selfishness, but you're expressing earlier how you're so happy that since Bitcoin was being adopted generally, you were no longer going to be the black sheep of your friends. So we all feel these pressures to fit in with society and to not be alone and to be in groups. So oftentimes the decisions which are best for us are actually good for those around us because we don't want to die alone, essentially. I think that's naturally governed. So rugged individualism would be naturally governed by the rules of being a social animal. Or, or social, um, you know, social humans. And then uh, when it comes to doctors making decisions, there's a lot of science actually, which uh, says that you can pressure people to do horrible things, to commit atrocities. Yep. There's the Milgram experiment where essentially a doctor in a white lab coat was able to get the subjects to kill somebody effectively, kept to keep on administering shocks. And then if you're not familiar with the Milgram experiment, you're listening. So essentially they had uh, like two subjects. One uh, was listening to a doctor and had their hands on some controls, which were to, to, as far as they were concerned, connected to another individual and would administer shocks whenever they would press these controls. So the doctor would say, apply pressure and they would press the button and, and another test subject in another room would start screaming. So the uh, subject one knew that there was some sort of correlation between between pressing this button and then this shock being administered. But oftentimes they would administer the shocks until the point of perceived death. Mm -hmm. And um, it's far more complicated than just having experts who went to school for four extra years, eight extra years making decisions for an entire population because it's it can become, there is a lot of uh, humanness involved that could create interferences in, in the normal uh, interactions of kind of daily life or, or, or fulfilling our duties in our professions. I'm curious, Graham, where do you see something like El Salvador going? I see El Salvador o opening the floodgates to governments around the world adopting this. And so it's really, really hard to, to be the pioneer. There's, there's that saying, uh, pioneers get slaughtered, settlers settle, or settlers prosper. Um, and, and I think that happens a lot uh, throughout history. Um, and so you can even see that in the Bitcoin world. Uh, Mt. Gox, you know, first huge Bitcoin exchange, got destroyed, dead, obliterated, all gone. Uh, a lot of the first people who uh, built the internet never ended up making any money because you know their ideas were too early. So they got destroyed and then people just built their ideas 10 years later once there was adoption and then they end up reaping the benefits of that. And so no, no country, no government wants to do something that's, that's bad for its citizens because then they don't get reelected. And so th there is, there's an interesting thing you I think you're talking about, um, you're talking about governments and you know, how, how they're, 
doing what's best and, and but they're all kind of bureaucrats sitting somewhere else making all these decisions. Uh, I, I saw a good tweet recently, it was, it was something to the effect of, when you understand that politics is just tribal warfare and uh, people trying to be reelected, everything kind of makes more sense. And so if you say, hey, Bitcoin is great, I love Bitcoin, and then there's a fatal bug in the Bitcoin code that no one saw coming, uh, even though that's very unlikely to happen, um, you know, you, you will not win re-election, like almost, almost certainly. And so people need the comfort of seeing someone else doing something, it's succeeding, so that they can take their own steps towards doing that. And so if El Salvador is, quote, successful, where some meaningful population percentage adopts Bitcoin, they start using it, they transact with it, they are happy, uh, and then the government gets reelected. I think that's when the floodgates open. That's when, I mean, we're already kind of seeing it in Panama, uh, Uruguay, uh, they're, they're rumbling about doing something very similar, but I think the majority of countries around the world are, are waiting to see what happens with that. Um, and so if, if that goes well, then I, I think that's when the floodgates open because people see, oh, this was successful. Now I'm allowed to try it as well. And if it doesn't work, well, I can still say, you know, the logic was there that it was successful somewhere else. So that is why I was able to undertake that decision. And maybe a government could still be reelected even if Bitcoin doesn't get adopted in the same way. Tell us about B is for Bitcoin. B is for Bitcoin is the first ever ABC book uh, about Bitcoin. And so uh, early on, so this was early on in my Bitcoin journey, uh, 2015, I was, I was looking at all these people starting companies and creating protocols and investing in Bitcoin and, and other cryptocurrencies. And I was like, I, I don't know what I can contribute to the space right now. Um, I wasn't quite ready to start a company. Uh, and, you know, there's an exchange that was really good that I was using called Quadriga. Um, and so no one needed to build another exchange. Quadriga was great. If uh, anybody is listening, Quadriga uh, stole everybody's money, ran away. Um, so that is a joke. Uh, but at the time I was looking at it, I was going, oh, you know what? The exchanges all work pretty well. This is fine. No one really needs to build another exchange. Um, I don't really know what company I need to make in Bitcoin. And then uh, my sister was, was having a kid and I said, wow, uh, what book do I want to read to my niece? Uh, hmm, I can do like A is for Apple, B is for Ball. And I was like, no, I don't want to do that. I, I would rather do A is for all coin, bus and booms, B is for Bitcoin, when moon. And so I started writing B is for Bitcoin at that point uh, in the hopes that I could read this to my niece uh, and that other people who have that same obsession with Bitcoin that I have, they can read it to their niece or their daughter or their son. Uh, or whoever, or just have it on their coffee table uh, as a nice book so that when people come over and they say, oh, are you a Bitcoiner? And then they go, oh, hold on, hold on, you know, let's talk about this. Um, and it can spark a conversation between people. So th that was really the genesis of it. Uh, at this point, it's uh, it's been a very fun way uh, for me to talk to people about Bitcoin, especially little kids. Um, that sounds weird saying it out loud now that I just realized that. <laughs> but, you know, I've read it to, to both my nieces at this point. I've read it to, to my girlfriend's nephew. Um, it, it's been a very good way to just spark interest in the topic with, with kids and with adults. Um, because people go, oh, wait, people are writing books about this stuff. And you go, yeah, not just kids' books. I mean, people are writing novels. People are writing page turners um, that actually dive into uh, all of the ins and outs of Bitcoin. So Andreas Antonopoulos writing The Internet of Money. Uh, uh, what is The Age of Cryptocurrency. Uh, Michael Casey, um, you know, there's a ton of books about Bitcoin and I encourage everybody, if you have even the slightest interest in learning a bit more, getting, getting some of these great books, um, whether it's an ABC book or, or whether it's, it's, a, it's much more substantial in terms of its knowledge uh, of what Bitcoin has to offer. Any plans to write a follow-up? I've, uh, I've been thinking about it a lot recently. Uh, my first idea for the follow-up is going to be a coloring book. Um, I, I've been thinking about that one a lot recently. Uh, there, there's been a ton of uh, Bitcoin and blockchain baby books uh, since BS for Bitcoin came out. Uh, so I think there's blockchain for babies. Uh, I think there's even BS for blockchain now. Uh, th there's a ton of, of, of great kids books out there. I think I would, I think the coloring book is still, I haven't been able to shake it from my mind. 
And so usually when I have an idea like that, you know, I'll think about it. Oh yeah, it's a great idea, but it's probably not a great idea. Most ideas that people have are not great. Uh, but if you can't shake it, then there, there might be something there. So I think probably the coloring book uh, might be the next one that I pursue. Maybe a basic economics for babies book will be uh, useful too. You know, I noticed that over the last year, every like first week rule of economics, like 10th grade economics, every rule you learn over the first week is being broken right now. Uh, but then I think back and I realize actually, I didn't learn any of these principles in school in the first place. I had to kind of discover them on my own anyway. Yeah. And, and to me, that's incredibly upsetting. Uh, it, it makes me very pessimistic for the future. Uh, the lack of especially financial and economic knowledge that, that kids get and that, that people get in school. Um, so, I mean, I had my first economics lesson in, in first year university when I was 18 years old. And I didn't really learn anything related to that whatsoever until 18. I mean, how do you, how do you go that's 18 when you, years? That's when you or I guess it might be different in Canada because you have more public, uh, public university system here. If you don't learn about economics at your first day of college, you're already in like $120,000 in debt. <laughs> yeah, so it's a, it's a bit different in Canada. Schools, schools uh, a little bit more affordable. Uh, for secondary school. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it's absolutely insane. You have kids taking out $100,000 loans, and they don't know how a credit card works. They don't know what an interest rate is. They don't know what compound interest is. They have, they have no concept uh, of, of any of these items. And, and even they don't understand, oh, even in bankruptcy, I can't discharge the student loan that I've taken on. And so you could have a kid and and we have tons of them now uh, at this point in the US and Canada and around the world where they're taking out two, $300,000 in student loans. And those are with them forever. And they're getting liberal arts degrees and they're working at Starbucks as a barista. And there's nothing wrong with working at Starbucks as a barista, but they've been sold this scam, in my opinion. In, in my opinion, it is a scam. Telling every single student they need to go to university uh, to be smart, to get a good job. And I think it is so incredibly sad that that's the case. I, I think I, I got kicked out of uh, grade 12 English, I think, uh, for voicing this opinion. Um, I, I don't remember exactly what we were talking about, but uh, oh my God, I hated this teacher so much. Uh, she did not like me. Um, I was very opinionated and I often disagreed with her. But it was something to the, to the effect of... Uh, it was, we were talking about university and, and getting a good job and what you're going to do after high school. And I made the point, you know what, if you're not good at English class, like you can go learn how cars work. You know, like you can go become a mechanic. You can go become a plumber. You can go become an electrician. Like those are noble professions that are now making hundred grand a year, like kind of minimum if you're a good plumber, if you're a good mechanic, or if you're a good electrician. And so the fact that she's like, she hated that. Like this teacher pretty much said, like I was calling people stupid and saying they're not smart enough to go to university. And I was saying, no, if you don't like this stuff and, and or if you're not good at it and you have other interests, you shouldn't be forced to go down this one path that everyone who's 40 plus years of age says is the right path. There are infinitely many different ways to make a living in the world. And not everybody needs to do the same thing because other people say that that's the socially correct thing to do. And and it, it just was mind boggling to me that, that this person pretty much said, oh, like, no, like, you don't understand, you don't get it. And I'm like, okay, it, I, I know I'm a dumb kid or whatever, but I feel like, I feel like I'm on the right track here. And I, I think that's being proven right now where we have these kids with 300 grand in debt and they can't find the job that they want. And it's because they were never supposed to try to find that job anyways. They, they were supposed to do something else. The school administration was like, here, sign here. All right, great. Time for economics 101. Over this way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Pretty, Th pretty much. Thank you so much, Graham, for joining us today. And everyone who listened, this has been the Gold, Silver, Bitcoin show. And we sat down today with Graham Moore, the author of B is for Bitcoin, which you can get right now on Amazon. Yep. Yep, definitely. Anywhere else? Uh, it's available on Amazon. Uh, it's on some websites. It depends on how the publisher is going. I believe it's on, it's on Walmart uh, online. It's on Barnes & Noble online. Um, I think Amazon's the easiest though for most people. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Graham, for joining us today. 
Thanks, Justin. Appreciate it. Thanks, everyone, for listening.